Welcome back to Polygamy, An Enemy Has Done This. I'm sitting here in the beautiful Austrian National Library, and if you don't know, in my pre-children life, I was a librarian, and I remember the first time that I walked into a library realizing that I could be paid to spend my time there. It was like, why would I do anything else? Um, just being in such an information and imagination-rich environment really brings me so much joy and energizes me. It's like the infinite possibilities of existence are funneled into a finite location. And so a library felt like an appropriate setting and fortunately all the books are in German so I won't be distracted um, as I tell this story. God's vision and comprehension of the story of humanity is complete. It's omniscient. Occasionally, God gives individuals a vision of the real story, the past, the present, the future of humanity as God sees it, which is reality. John the Revelator had such a vision, as did the Book of Mormons, Nephi, and Ether. Having a vision like this meant that these men saw what actually happened during the restoration, including how polygamy came into the church. So if they were here, they could just tell us the real story in detail, but of course they're not. We have the unsealed portion of the Book of Mormon, which cries out to us from the dust, but it doesn't give us names and dates. And since no one today claims to have seen such a heavenly vision of how polygamy entered the restoration, our narrative today relies upon the stories which have been handed down to us and the records which were available at the time the narrative was crafted. If you're saying to yourself, hang on, why can't we just believe the story told by the people who were there? The short answer is we can't, because the stories of polygamy's beginnings in the church conflict to such an incredible degree that it is literally impossible for everyone to have been telling the truth. There is a conspiracy in every conceivable version of this story, including the one we tell now which is that Joseph Smith and other leaders secretly conspired to indoctrinate polygamy into the church. I think this is why for some time members were discouraged from digging into church history. It's very messy. But if the parable of the vineyard applies here, in order to get healthy and good fruit, we have to get down in the dirt and dig around in the roots, even be willing to toss some dung onto them. Our current polygamy narrative was presented in 2014 through the Gospel Topics essays and has been included in the New Saints books. No authors are listed, but it appears to be our church historians and general scribes' best effort to make the different stories fit together in the most faith-promoting way possible. But for so, so many people, hearing that God commanded a married father of, at that time, seven children to marry a 14-year-old girl, and then more teenagers and dozens of other women, some of them already married themselves, without the consent or even knowledge of his wife. I guess the nicest way to put that is that I have yet to hear anyone explain to me how this narrative promotes faith in Jesus Christ. In Carolyn Pearson's book, The Ghost of Eternal Polygamy, she reconstructs our current polygamy narrative through a slightly altered lens. Sister Pearson tells our Latter-day Saint polygamy story as if Joseph Smith was wrong in his belief that God commanded polygamy. Joseph believed it, instituted it, but we can see from the fruits that this was wrong and we can let it go. Interestingly, this is also the overall message of Brittany Chapman Nash's book, Let's Talk About Polygamy, published by Deseret Book which also makes the point that we are no longer expected to have a testimony of polygamy to be members in good standing. I'm grateful for these sisters' efforts to make sense of our church history, and I'm especially thankful for this book because the doctrine of many wives and concubines had been a psychological nightmare for me for decades. Nothing in this book surprised me. I knew exactly what it was about the moment I saw the title because this ghost lived with me. The reason that I'm so thankful for it is because it served as a catalyst for me to personally seek out greater light and knowledge specifically about polygamy in the eternities and the true nature of God. But this take on Joseph Smith just tastes terrible. I mean, a story where a man sees God, has many angelic visitations, and preaches a gospel of peace and love, and then, while still preaching these things, gets mixed up on marriage to such a degree that he publicly denied the body of the church and broke his usually pregnant and nursing wife's heart by going behind her back to marry teenage girls and dozens of other women, all the while being an otherwise really good person who testified to the true nature of God. 
to quote one of my extremely believing family members upon hearing the Gospel Topics essays describe this narrative, this person said, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. A lot of members do not believe this story. This story has been the death of so many testimonies since its first telling that the damage is literally incalculable. So today I'm going to tell what I consider to be our best Latter-day Saint polygamy story if polygamy is a tear sown by Satan, which I believe it is. The reason I am doing this is because President Nelson asked the women of the church to speak up with our impressions, our insights, and our inspiration. These videos that I'm making on the topic of polygamy are my impressions, my insights, and my inspiration. Nobody has to listen. I don't expect any changes to be made because of what I say, but I'm going to say it because I've been asked and because God has given me something to say. And that is that I have seen who women are and polygamy is not part of our divine nature nor destiny. It has never been the divine intention in any dispensation for God's daughters to be used as concubines or multiple wives. In fact, polygamy actually harms women's ability to fulfill our divinely ordained stewardship. Yes, humans have agency. We can do whatever we want, but God has never commanded polygamy because, for example, it allows more children to be born in a shorter amount of time, or for any of the other justifications we have told ourselves. We can know that now because, praise God, it's the time of the harvest, and this tear is now discernible from the wheat. It has been scientifically measured and demonstrated that none of the supposed benefits of polygamy actually stand up to scrutiny. Regarding the example I just gave, polygamy actually decreases the amount of total children born in a population. Many of these facts are laid out in the 2018 book, The Evils of Polygyny, Evidence of Its Harm to Women, Men, and Society by Rose McDermott. The analysis of data on polygyny, which is the specific term for a husband with multiple wives, found that every positive benefit associated with polygyny was anecdotal. The unique features that polygyny brings to families are all negative, statistically speaking. Just stop and think about that for a second. No benefit was able to be proven statistically. And if you're thinking, well, Latter-day Saints following prophetic direction between 1840-something and 1890-ish would have been the exception, that is incorrect. The exact same detrimental effects of polygyny are measurable, statistically, across all polygynous groups throughout time as far as there are records with data to measure, whether they are the Mormon pioneers, devout Muslims, or atheists. The fruits are always the same. Ask yourself, if God is trying to teach humans something important. Can you think of any other divine command or principle that results in no measurable benefit? Has God ever given a command or principle that produces universally bad fruit? So I know the polygamy story that we've been telling ourselves is not true. The doctrine of men having many wives and concubines did not come from God. It's uncomfortable to say that because it puts me at odds with our current narrative. But as I've mentioned in other videos, our polygamy narrative has radically changed over the years. And even historian and author of Rough Stone Rolling, Richard Bushman, has said as much. In a group discussion, which was then addressed by Dan Peterson, Brother Bushman answered a question about the challenge to faith when members are confronted with church history that doesn't match what they were taught by the missionaries and in Sunday school. And in part of his answer, he said, the dominant narrative is not true. It can't be sustained. So the church has to absorb all this new information or it will be on very shaky grounds. And that's what it's trying to do. And it'll be a strain for a lot of people, older people especially, but I think it has to change. Elder Packer had this sense of protecting the little people, but the price of protecting the grandmothers was the loss of the grandsons. They've got a story that doesn't work. So we just have to change. Another word for change is repent. Even President Hinckley oriented us toward changing our polygamy narrative. During his interview on the Larry King live show, Larry King asked President Hinckley what it meant that he was a prophet. President Hinckley replied that it meant that he was responsible for declaring doctrine. 
In this exact same interview, Larry King tried to get to the bottom of polygamy, of course, right? Because that's our biggest stumbling block. And in their exchange, President Hinckley said, speaking of polygamy, it's not doctrinal. It was also during President Hinckley's tenure that the church released the family, a proclamation to the world. As an English major in college, I was trained to analyze text for meaning, and I did editing for the literary journal at BYU, and I understand how to correctly use grammar and syntax and semantics, and there is no space for polygamy in this document. It says, a man and a woman. In the English language, you can't say that in the same phrase. This A cannot linguistically mean one absolutely without exception, while this A means at least but not limited to one. To argue that the most recent teachings of the United First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve include or even make possible polygamy is to ignore the meaning of the English language and to pretend that words have no definition. There is no space for polygamy in this document. I can't believe we have to get down to this level of minutiae, but it's because we have no doctrinal clarity on this issue. So a reckoning has been coming over polygamy and other related issues. And frankly, the generations that are here now won't hold off that reckoning anymore. I don't think we could if we tried. That said, I do believe there is a way to tell this story that does not utterly condemn our ancestors, my polygamous ancestors, but instead simply frees them of the accountability of this and other related sins upon our heads. And I think it's a good idea to leave space in our hearts for this everyone did their best story because the most important thing is for us to know true doctrine. It is true doctrine which will allow us to know the true and living God. The truth about doctrine is actually easier to discern than truth about individuals, especially individuals who lived generations before and whom we have never met. And since some people will not even consider that polygamy is a tear sown by Satan because of the implications, because of what it would mean about past church leaders, let's see what the best case scenario is for the leaders and ourselves if polygamy is not of God. Of necessity, this is going to be a high-level summary because addressing every single piece of historical evidence would take thousands of hours of video or pages of a book, and that's not what this is. I'm going to roughly follow the format of the Gospel Topics essays and just use the evidence and scripture that supports this narrative. Because I'm focusing on how the church became ensnared by polygamy, I will be discussing historical events through that lens. But you could tell this whole story using a different lens a financial one, for example, and paint a very good picture of how things went wrong, that the Book of Mormon preached against seeking after riches and economic systems which result in wealth stratification, that the law of the Lord given to the saints gave specific instructions to avoid falling into such a trap, and that the Prophet Joseph's revelations continuously warned the saints against their shortcomings in that regard. But here we are today with many poor among us and others are exceedingly rich and we do not have Zion. So polygamy is not the only story that can or should be told as we seek to establish Zion. But I would argue that accepting God's law of marriage is the beginning of wisdom. For that reason, it's the story I'm going to tell.